show you how. A thoughtful touch, the Hitachi Touch. Get the Hitachi Touch at Haney Sewing and Sound on New Detrunk Road in Maple Ridge. Drop in and see a Hitachi demonstration soon. BCTV. Good morning. Year after year, out comes a massive report like this, the report of the Auditor General of Canada. And it's full of the sloppiness, the carelessness, the difficulties of government financing, which all add up to a large, inefficient hole in the taxpayer's pocket. Well, the Auditor General of Canada is here this morning, uh, was a Vancouver accountant in Campbell Sharp, and his name is Ken Dye. And I'm going to try and get some of the really glaring examples of government inefficiency from the Auditor General Ken Dye. Now, I have a special treat for you this morning because Van der Zam has put his foot in his mouth again. On the program the other day, he described trail school boards in not very nice terms. Here, in fact, is what Van der Zam said. You produced a series of report cards and I tried to read the report and it made absolutely no sense whatsoever which is the worst school district in British Columbia? Well, the worst school district on the basis of that report and the analysis done of it would appear to be trail. It appears that the minister, who is now in Hawaii on vacation, lucky for him, has made a mistake. And that trail is not the worst school district in British Columbia. And I had an irate call from trail about which you will hear later on the program this morning. And of course, Following up Mr. Uh, Van der Zam's policy of doing everything in public, I have this morning two top officials of the education system. Well, Gary Bejan, the chairman of the school trustees, and Larry Keane of the BC Teachers Federation. I've no doubt they'll want to carve up Van der Zam, and I'll put to them his particular point that the only way to avoid layoffs is for the teachers to throw away arbitration awards and accept zilch as of now. First, though, the man who's going to tell us about the hole in the taxpayer's pocket, Ken Dye, Auditor General of Canada. The Auditor General's report comes out every year. It makes headlines for five minutes or maybe a day and a half. And if there are no horses on the payroll, it doesn't get that much attention. This year, however, Ken Dye, the Auditor General, since when, Mr. Dye? April 1, 1981. Oh, you've only been 18 months or so. 18 yeah. months. Yeah. 18 months what of that? nightmare? It's been fun. Very fun. interesting. It would seem to me, though, however, that Canada seems to have a massive potential failure as big as the British Concord financially on its books. Is that so? You're talking about uh, Canada. Canada. How much are we stuck for with Canada, which does not seem to be in any way a profitable operation? At the moment, I think, uh, well, as at the, the government year end, it was $1.35 billion in uh, guarantees. Plus, there's an investment in there. Uh, there was $200 million after the year end, and I think there was uh, roughly $200 million in uh, before the year end. I'm not exactly sure. On so I, numbers. as a taxpayer, am part of the guarantees for $1.35 billion, which you say will not be sufficient to maintain Canada. Plus the advances. Will Canada go down the tube? I don't, I'm not the auditor of Canada, so I don't know what's going on in there. But you know about the advances in the guarantees. Oh, yes, together. I see that from Canada's books. All right, from Canada's books, can you tell me if the Canada guarantees are even bigger, a bigger disaster than the Dome bailout? I'm not in a position to know anything about the Dome bailout either because I'm not the auditor of Dome. I thought as Auditor General of Canada, you had your tentacles into every financial uh, arrangement in Canada. No, I'm responsible to report to Parliament. That's where my responsibility, not to the government, but to Parliament as a whole, to the 282 elected members. That's my job. But there are certain operations that you don't have the authority to investigate. Is that correct? I'm the auditor of uh, all the departments and agencies of the country, the Northwest Territories, the Yukon Territories, and uh, 
a, a large number of small enterprises plus a large number of the crown corporations. But the many of the most visible uh, crown corporations, I'm not the auditor of. For example, Air Canada, CN, Petrocan. But these are uh, large financial mines into which we can pour unlimited billions and guarantees, etc., etc. It's possible. Generally speaking, what's the state of the nation's finances? I remember, was it you or was it the man before you who said government spending was out of control? That was Jim Nacdell in, in 1976, and he really made Parliament uh, sit up and take notice. Now, when, when you make recommendations, are they attended to? Or are they just ignored by the autocratic mandarins of the government? I think since Jim caught their attention in 1976, there's been a tremendous uh, increase in attention of my office, uh, mainly because you know, politicians don't like to be embarrassed, government officials don't like to be embarrassed, and so there has been a response. On a scale of 1 to 10, in what you've audited, <laughs> how would you rate the government's financial controls? Going back to the remark that the spending was out of control. Well, I guess Jim found a zero. Um, I'm too new to be able to know how, how high 10 is. There's a long way to go, but I see improvement. You see some improvement? Yes, I do. You wouldn't even go for five off the top of your head, though, would you? I, uh, I get troubled speculating. You know, we auditors are conservative folk. We're... I can understand that. Now, to some specific things. Uh, I noticed here, and I did a story to f 35 years ago over a scandal involving no tender contracts of $3 million. Is it true? How many government contracts are let out now without tender? How much in total? Well, uh, I think it's about 3.4 billion. There's about 8.8 .8 billion. I'm talking off the top of my head with numbers. I've been skiing for two weeks and I've forgotten all these numbers. But I think it's 8.8 .8 billion in total, about 3.4 sole source. And of that, about 300 million are let by the depart departments and agencies without a further review by the Treasury Board or the Department of uh, Supply uh, and Service. Let me stop you. Now, I know you're a lot not, of numbers. You're not in politics. There are $3.4 billion of the government tenders, government contracts given out without tender. Yes. Does that not leave a vast hole for uh, conflict of interest in helping one's friends if there are no tenders? Some might give the, uh, the possibility of an appearance, and that's why there are uh, reviews made if a department or agency wants to spend more than, I think it's $30,000, uh, certain re reviews are required and, and we found where the review takes place in uh, supply and services over at Treasury then generally the guidelines of the government are followed but in 300 million dollars worth of uh, sole source contracts without tender uh, in the departments and agencies there's uh, a lot of room for abuse and we're very concerned about that but it's only 300 million dollars uh, the auditor general can't ignore 300 million dollars that's but your money and mine what's 300 million dollars i'd see that you weren't even able to investigate that incredible petrofina acquisition by petro canada how much is involved in that one i think it's about 1.7 billion dollars the um that's not all that money has been spent yet. The money, uh, I think, is picked up at about a cent a liter. Uh, it goes into the Canadian ownership account. And the Canadian ownership account lends the money to Petrocan. Petrocan uh, pays off the shareholders. And then at the end of the year, as I understand it, Petrocan uh, loans are, are cancelled in favor of uh, an investment by Canada in Petrocan. Are you going to pursue this investigation of the Petrocanada's acquisition of Petrofina? I think we should. Uh, when we started out, we thought we'd find um, reasonable evidence in the Department of uh, Energy, Mines and Resources that the government would be able to demonstrate due regard for economy. One of my mandates, I have to assure Parliament that there is due regard for economy. We went and asked Energy. They said, no, all the information is over at uh, Petrocan. We then uh, talked to Finance, we talked to Treasury Board, we talked to everybody we could think of in the government circles who might have information regarding the information going to Cabinet in order that Mm -hmm. A reasonable decision be made. And we were unable to find uh, satisfactory evidence within the departments that there was due regard for economy. So I've, I've instructed my staff to pursue this and I've written to Mr. Hopper. And um, when I left Ottawa just before Christmas, um, I had not received a response, but I really hadn't had enough time Was for a response. Is this where you ran into point. trouble with the celebrated Michael Pitfield over your request for access to cabinet memos? Uh, Michael Pitfield and I have had a continuing discussion all year long on uh, access to information and uh, he I think clearly understands my position and I think I clearly understand his position and we're trying to get uh, our two trains to stop passing in the night. Except that he's gone now. He's well, gone on to greater glory in the Senate. Um, 
And he's only got a hundred thousand a year pension and fifty-five thousand as a senator. Will he still be talking to you? I would think the principles remain the same, uh, whether or not uh, Mr. Pitfield is there or not. But uh... in other words, you're telling me very diplomatically that you're engaged in continuing discussions to make sure that you have the proper access to which you're entitled, so that you can examine the holes in the taxpayers' pockets. There's no doubt in my mind. I've got all the authority I need. The biggest single threat is what? Crown corporations to our stability. I don't see Crown corporations as, as a threat as long as they're properly accountable to Parliament. And my concern is they are not accountable. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm really troubled. Now, I don't know if it's a fair question to ask you. Is it true that a few days before a company went bankrupt, it was given $2.7 billion in loans by the Department of Regional and Economic Expansions? I think the amount's wrong. I think it was much smaller than that. It wasn't 2.7 billion, but there was a case in well, this last be year. Well, it was 2.7 billion. No, that's a lot of money. Must be 2.7 million. I, I think it was more like 2.7 million. It was a case where uh, funds were advanced to, I think, the corporation's bank, and the bank uh, shut the company down. I think it was nine days later. Consequently, the amounts, I guess, have, have been lost. That's dreadful. It didn't indicate any due regard for economy. We'll never get that back out of I don't know the specifics of the case. Um, I understand there's a proposal to, in this case, to uh, redeem the corporation by lending it more money. Have you any good ones to <coughs> say about the government accounting, the Treasury Board, or uh, good things? Yeah. Really? Uh, in fact, I have. I, I'd like to be balanced, and uh, you'll see in the beginning of my report uh, some bouquets, if you very modest bouquets. But indeed, I think there are people who work hard in government. I think there's people who are intelligent and, and are trying to do the right thing. And, uh, and consequently, I, I like to acknowledge that. In fact, you even say much to my shock. Not only is it a welcome attention to the drawing costs, but willingness to face up to dismissing unsatisfactory employees. Is that a new trend in government? Well, it's uh, new to me. I'm, uh, I find that quite refreshing. Now, the statistics are appallingly low in terms of, you know, if you were to uh, question me on the numbers, they're, they're not large. But at least there is a shift in attitude, and I think that's the beginning of, of uh, important things to come. Next, I'm going to question the Auditor General, Ken Dye, about immigration rackets, which are spelled out, much to my surprise, very clearly in the latest Auditor General's report to the House of Commons. After the break. The most shocking part of the Auditor General's report for my specific interest relates to immigration. Mr. Dye, is it a fact that there are all kinds of illegal immigration networks, irregularities, abuses of family reunification in this country, and that virtually nothing is being done by the department to clean up their act? I think we found that uh, Ottawa headquarters doesn't really know what's going on in the various regional branches. And so what you say, I can relate to. You can relate to, but can you relate to me in a little bit of detail? Is family class, a family reunification, a racket? I don't think our auditors found that it was a racket. We didn't have evidence, but then that kind of evidence isn't obvious. But you found many abuses, did you not? Yes, we found not only the abuses, but the, the possibility of future abuse. Right, and you say quite clearly here, efforts being made to detect and break up illegal immigration networks are proving insufficient. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Now. Next point I want to raise with you, and that is, um, what percentage of all our immigrants are family reunification? Oh, boy. Um, F to... Figure is 40. That sounds, uh, that's my recollection. Uh, are many of these people prepared uh, for Canada? Think... Uh, do they have job applications, or do they have no training? And are they a threat in our social programs? I think our concern is that uh, there is a, a technical phrase that the department uses as to their uh, ability to f uh, fit into the Canadian milieu, and, and I think there is a serious question being asked whether or not um, family class people in, uh, are uh, suitable to fit into the uh, on arrival in, into the Canadian lifestyle. Can you tell me about the courier parent racket, which you outline in your book? <laughs> well, um, as I understand this kind of operation, uh, families come over. As a, as a group, or, or parents come over and bring the kids, and parents go back home. So basically, it's uh, parents stay long enough to get the kids established. And then they go back again. Yeah. What they do, therefore, is they come in on immigration. It says here, 50% of parents with children around 21 years of age 
returning to their country of origin as soon as or even before their children settle in Canada. Why? That, that is obviously wrong. It's permitted by the, uh, the laws, um, the way it, they seem to be uh, monitoring. Engagements and marriages of convenience, pregnancies of convenience, unverifiable or dubious family relationships and false or altered documents are some of the methods used. Yes, we found that. And you make it clear that the immigration in Canada has warned from overseas about all these rackets and does damn little about it. Is that correct? I don't think they understand what's going on in the branches. Headquarters doesn't have control over its own operations. Now what about ministerial permits? Well, there are thousands of them. I think the They're delegated right out to the branches. 65,000 yes. uh, ministerial permits just now. And you also... Very make, discretionary. Yeah, and you make the point that there are many young people who squeeze in on their family unification improperly coming here for jobs without training. Well, there's 10% of the people who do come, uh, who apply, apply from within the country, which is not within our guidelines or our rules. Give me that again. It's my understanding that of all the people that come into this country, about 10% of them apply after they're in. And I think we found evidence that... Uh, Immigration officials would give varying levels of advice. For example, you could go to uh, one immigration depot and be told, well, just snip over the border and uh, apply again. Uh, go to another immigration depot and you may find out you have to go all the way back to your uh, Caribbean uh, residence and start again. You know, it's funny you should mention that because yesterday I had a phone call from Smithers from a German family <coughs> who came out here on the advice of the immigration in Bonn who said, just fill in the papers and take them with you. Now they're being ordered deported, even though they've spent, they tell me, 50000 in this country and is qualified for a job. Well, I can throw this book in their face, can't I? Well, there's more than that. There's a whole set of rules that they should be following. And it's all set down, and if the uh, system were um, operated as it's designed, then we wouldn't have many of these problems. But there's so much discretion. I think discretion is needed. These are human situations. You make the point that the immigration officers at the borders don't use the microfiche to detect undesirables. That's right. That's in your it's report too complicated, too, too time-consuming. And you make the point, too, that nothing is being done to remove illegals with criminal convictions from this country. Yes, there's a lot of people in this country who are illegal aliens. I think it uh, wasn't in our report, but I think it was about uh, 200,000 people. Well, you know, one hesitates to raise this subject, Mr. Dye, because one invariably gets accused of some form of racism, directly or indirectly. But let me ask you. Is the Immigration Commission, Employment and Immigration, demonstrated by your report as not competent? I think they have all kinds of troubles they're going to have to improve on. I don't know what you do about it because it's just a... I mean, I, I know that the saying is all you need is one illegal immigrant from one country and certain people operating illegal networks here can bring in the whole village because of the family unification. I think there's a, a number of people wise to Canada's uh, a fairly liberal approach to uh, immigration and uh, they take advantage of it. I can't prove this, but I might as well tell you, you might keep it in mind, that I understand that false ages are being used on entry from some countries so that people can collect the old age pension 10 years before really qualified. Would that shock you? Not at all. There's all kinds of tricks in the books that uh, neither you nor I could even uh, imagine that they're using. Your recommendations, however, on this immigration racket, do you have any specific of these immigration, illegal immigration networks, do you have any specific thrust that you'd like the department to follow? Yes, I'd like the uh, department to follow up on its own guidelines, its own rules. I mean, it's, it's got a plan. What I want it to do is operate, and uh, operate the way it's intended to, using discretion where it's necessary, uh, but uh, being consistent across the whole country mm -hmm. and have headquarters understand what's going on uh, over a 4,000 mile border. Just one last depressing little feature. I understand we've lost a number of immigrants to whom we have advanced money and which, you, we, which will be written off. That's About 9,000 immigrants are uh, Correct. Uh, difficult to find at the moment. And therefore we can't collect from them. And a total of $43 million? Sounds right. Yeah. Not a large sum in itself, but when the money was paid out by, uh, you know, on behalf of Canadian taxpayers, it was expected to be paid back. Uh, overall, therefore, was this your, your most disturbing, detailed investigation in the government? I've got 15 chapters there. That's but one, sir. Do <laughs> you want to pick another one? <laughs> anyway, how about taking some calls from the public? Sure. To see if they think if you're doing your job. Ken Dye, Auditor General of Canada, on the phone. Now, after the break.
two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay. No, I don't like one. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Auditor General, um, go ahead to Ken Dye, the Auditor General. Okay, the question I've got in here is right. regarding those um, contracts that were awarded without bid. Yes. Right. Okay. How about a, such a contract, let's say like a, a $500 deal? Let's say like a government building where the uh, a tree fell across the, across the roof. Well, now you're complaining there was no tender on removing the tree. Yeah, okay, but to fix the roof, you need some kind of a contract for that. Oh, sure, and, and uh, they have discretion when they need money. They can spend up to uh, $30,000, I think it is, Yeah. Uh, and, and get the tree removed. That, that's why there's some flexibility in the system. Yeah, you've got to have some flexibility. Oh, sure you do. Who can authorize 30000 The Deputy Minister? Yes. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I'd like to uh, ask both you, Jack, and uh, Mr. Dye, if you think it is right that um, Canada allows in uh, un an unlimited number of immigrants from uh, Central American countries such as Guatemala and El Salvador where um, they will probably face certain death if they returned, if they are known to not sympathize with Okay, I, I don't think it's proper to ask the Auditor General to give a political opinion on the admission of refugees. Well, you are talking about that subject. Well, no, I'll so give you, you an opinion. I'll give you an opinion on it. I think my specific complaint about the immigration rackets lies in family reunification. I have no objection to refugees coming to this country who are legitimately in fear of their lives. I do object to a drunk coming off a ship being reprimanded by a skipper and then being advised in the waterfront to say you're a political refugee and stay in the country. That's the kind of political refugee I object to. We can't refuse our proper and appropriate amount. This morning we're taking 2,000 from Chile, I noticed, as political refugees. Fair enough answer? Fair enough. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Is that me, Jeff? That's you, ma'am. Um, I just want um, your opinions on um, our case. Uh, we've been over here for nine years. There's seven of us in the family, uh, seven brothers and sisters, and also uh, mother and father. And we've been trying for the past three years to get another sister over, and she's been sponsored. We've got, you know, lots of money between us. We can all make sure that she's settled and... Um, How old is she? Pardon? How old is she? Well, she's 40 years old. She's got a husband and five children. But Good. the children are all um, working age, and I think this is what the problem well, is. Let me tell you, I think Mr. Dye could answer this question, too, that if she were lucky enough to get a ministerial permit, she would have no problem. Is that correct? That's probably so. Probably the only way you can go, being from the UK, is by a ministerial permit, which means leaning on a mouthy MP and on Axworthy. I'm quoting this report to him. Yeah, Jack, we wrote to Axworthy and we've had letters from him. Um, ma'am? Uh, you know, they just say there's nothing they can do. But, okay, you know, ma'am. Some people manage it, some people can't. This is it, you know. Uh, we're just wondering, uh, you know, you know how... Um, what, what can we do now? Nobody Who can, can we explain turn it. To in there? The Auditor General's report makes it very clear that he's unhappy with the method of their operation in many ways and with the lack of the total following of the guidelines which are laid down in the department. Indeed. Right. Go ahead, please. Hello, Mr. Yeah. Webster. Yes. Uh, Mr. Dye, I'd like to ask um, why or how um, the gasoline tax. Uh, has an excise tax of 1.5 cents a liter, and propane does not have an excise tax on it, or whether this is your department. And Mr. Webster, the next time you have Mr. McGear on, maybe you could ask him why uh, our propane is exempt entirely of any highway tax. Well, to your, uh, your caller, uh, Mr. Webster, I don't know the answer why the government decided not to tax propane. Uh, that's their prerogative. My, my job as auditor is not to question the policy, but once the policy is set, to see that it's implemented. Well, my, uh, you know... Go on. I'm sorry, my objection as a gasoline consumer is, in fact, uh, to be paying 20% uh, in taxes and let uh, allow propane to be used on our highways. And after McGear, Mr. McGear is uh, through advocating propane use, uh, he's going to have to tax that. He's saying that we can save uh, up 18 to 19 percent on... Okay, as a matter of fact, McGeer will be here on Friday morning about something else, but obviously he wants to at least encourage propane, and it's partly national policy, I think, to cut down on the importation of oil. But someone has to pay for a highway tax, Mr. Webster. Agreed. Well, you can ask a, a good old Doc McGeer yourself on Friday morning if you can get through. Go ahead from Kelowna. 
Yes, Mr. Dye, do you make observations of the various departments from which you have expressed concern during the course of the year? Yes, I do. And would it be proper for you to uh, also attach one of your staff to these departments to see that this is being done? Sometimes we uh, lend our staff to uh, departments when the uh, House of Commons, for example, was being reorganized. Some of our key people were in there. Normally, though, um, they, they would draw staff from other sources. We, being auditors, we don't want to be in a position where we uh, set up a system which is management and then find ourselves commenting on our own uh, involvement. So we it, should look for better, better things to come then. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, how much did your audit cost? What's the budget for the Auditor General? About uh, $38 million. Oh, have you doubled the staff? No, no, I have a staff of 601 people plus about 700 contractors who are uh, in from time to time. It's the equivalent of about another 100 more people. We're a large, very large oh, auditing yeah. firm. But it's still a spit in the bucket compared to some of the money. <clears throat> we're about, we're less than a nickel a hundred, uh, one nickel to every hundred dollars worth of government expenditure. Good. And next, it's dropping. My next you'll be trying down. to tell me the CBC is worth three cents per taxpayer per day. I don't like these statistical <laughs> accounting figures. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. That's you, sir. Oh, uh, Mr. Webster. Yes. Uh, I'd like to speak to the minister, if I may. He's not the minister. He's the auditor general. Well, the auditor general, sir. Right. Carry on. My, what I was getting at is that uh, he mentioned, happened to mention that there was 9,000 legal entry uh, immigrants into the country, and uh, he doesn't know where they are, and it cost 43, the Canadian taxpayer, $43 million to uh, locate and support these people, and then they turn around and they want to bring in another, well, mind you, I do not disagree with the idea of bringing in the South Americans, or the Latin Americans. I agree 100%, give them all the aid possible, but how much more money are we going to have to spend because how many, what's the percentage of these people that are going to be, uh, uh, a charge against the public. Good. You make a, you make a good point on those who become a charge against the public. Is there a standard for for the self-sufficiency of immigrants which is followed not, at all? Not that I'm aware of. I don't think they have, uh, or if they do have them, they don't apply guidelines to, to determine whether or not somebody is properly settled. That's right. He was talking about the 9100 uh, yeah. 9, 9, overdue 100 loan. Who haven't uh, been found to pay back the amounts. Yeah, and the amount actually, to be precise, is $10.3 Is it? In uh, that case. I'd forgotten. I see on page 175 of the report. From Quinnell, go ahead, please. Hello, Jack. Yeah. I'm a retired tax accountant. I would like to direct a question to the Auditor General. Hmm. Uh, when, if ever, are we going to get the tax department audited? Go ahead. Well, we, uh, we audit the tax department every year in order to determine that the revenue side of the accounts of Canada are properly stated. And in fact, the, uh, the auditors general across uh, the nation in each province, for example, here in British Columbia, Irma Morrison, relies on our audit work done uh, in Ottawa in order that for her to express an opinion on the BC accounts. Uh, when the public is never made aware of this, of uh, what the results of this audit are, as far as I'm, I know, the Department of National Revenue was reported in our annual report several years ago. We did a comprehensive audit there, and then every year I give an opinion uh, in about, uh, it's dated usually mid-September, and, it, and it's published in October, along with the Accounts of Canada. And there you're getting a, a situation where uh, if you don't hear something, you can have assurance that the accounts are being collected, taxes are being collected. Thank you. Thank you. You don't investigate the operations of the tax department, do Yes, you? we do. As well as the revenues they're collecting. You bet we do. And do you investigate the tactics? We uh, investigate all their processes. All their processes. Go ahead, please. Hello. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask the Auditor General um, how you would respond to a Conservative House of Commons report, I believe in, given in November, which states that a full 30% of government employees do not know what their jobs are. Uh, the report your, your uh, viewers uh, discussing is my report. And uh, it, it comes from a survey uh, done by my office. First time we've gone out and, and publicly surveyed. And we sent about 4,600 questionnaires to uh, members of the public service in all uh, regions of the country and, uh, and all levels of the public service and inquired what they thought about the, uh, the process of uh, employee uh, performance and, and uh, personal evaluation annually. What was their final conclusion? That 30% didn't know to have punched the board. 30% of them uh, surveyed were very unclear about the uh, 
about the kinds of job performance that was expected of them. This was interesting because it was supervisors feeling about their supervisors. They were also unclear. This is a generalization coming from the public service itself. Hopefully some re remedial measures will be taken in this vast the public service of Canada. Treasury Board is uh, working on it right away. One more call. Go ahead, please. Hi. Um, I'd like to ask, what is the most important asset that Canada has well, that's a good question. The most, the heaviest debt, the most important asset Canada has is people. I think it's people, yeah. So I would agree, I. it's people. Well, Mr. Dye, uh, we'll see you next year when the report comes out, eh? Love to come. Meanwhile, when Lloyd Axworthy comes along, I'm going to hit him over the head with his boat and see if he knows whether he's, up, you know, coming or going. He's aware of the report. And I don't. I'll leave my personal comments about Axworthy from that location. My thanks to Ken Dye, Auditor General of Canada. Next, we're going to talk... Uh, Right now, as the phone calls come through, to uh, school superintendent and trail, and then we're going to interview on the Vandalism follow-up, Mrs. Gary Beijing and Larry Keen. After the break. Just to refresh your memory of what happened on the program with uh, Bill Van Der Zem, the Minister of Education, the other day, I made an offhand remark about the report cards and worst and best schools. I tried to understand it and couldn't. Now, here's what Van Der Zem said to me. You produced a series of report cards, and I tried to read the report, and it made absolutely no sense whatsoever. Which is the worst school district in British Columbia? Well, the worst school district, on the basis of that report and the analysis done of it, would appear to be trail. Now, as a result of that broadcast, I received a call from a gentleman who is now on the line, who is John Hogarth, the superintendent of schools in District 11 and trail. Good morning, Mr. Hogarth. Good morning, Jack. What do you first have to say? I, I, I'm sorry I didn't pursue the detailed reasons of why he said it was the worst school district in B.C., but you've made some investigations and you have something to tell me. Well, Jack, the minister has not communicated with our school district on this particular matter, but we have determined that the performance indicators he's utilizing to come up with his rating on the best and worst school districts lists are pupil-teacher ratio, the administrative cost per pupil, and the increase in the per-pupil cost between 1978 and 82. Right. And using these three indicators, and in stating that Trail is the worst district in the province, the Minister of Education is wrong. And I intend to back that up, if you'll permit me, with a few short facts. Yep. The Minister issued a report card recently to Trail, as you know, and to every other school district in the province. Now, that very same report card from the Minister says that Trail's pupil-teacher ratio is four-tenths of one percent less than the provincial average. In right. other words, very, very close to that average. Mm -hmm. The minister's document says that Trail's administrative salary per pupil is 15 percent less than the provincial average for administrative salaries. Right. Now, Jack, we also receive another document from the ministry every year, and it's one which compares all 75 school districts' spending of money one to the other. And that document tells us that 33 school districts have a lower pupil-teacher ratio than Trail, and 41 have a higher pupil-teacher ratio than Trail. 44 school districts have a higher administrative cost per pupil, 30 have a lower cost. 29 school districts have a higher total cost per pupil. Now, in addition, Jack, and I think this is very important, that report card says, the one the minister sent us, says quite clearly that the students in this school district in Trail perform academically higher than the provincial averages for English, mathematics, and science. Now that reflects good management, but it also reflects an excellent teaching force in this school district. No. In other words, the school district's costs are at an average or less in this province, and Trill's pupils achieve above average according to the minister's own data. Well, what the devil was the minister referring to? Well, uh, that's a good question. I phoned yesterday down to the Ministry of Education and talked to several senior officials within the ministry in an effort to find out why the minister singled out our particular school district. And I was told the following. First of all, there is no information in the ministry's possession to support the notion that Trail is the worst school district in the province. None whatsoever. In fact, the information they have tells them, and they have 
turn told us mm -hmm. the trail is within the normal acceptable range for school districts. That's from senior ministry officials. I was also told that the list of the best and worst school districts in this province was not developed by the Ministry of Education. I repeat, it was not developed by the Ministry of Education. Well, let me give you aid and comfort. I spoke to a senior official in the department myself this morning, who can't be named at the moment, until he gets the minister's permission. He confirms what you say, and he says that uh, there was a separate report done I, an internal memo of some kind not connected with this, with which there is some considerable confusion, I'm saying, in the minister's mind. So, trail is off the hook on the report. Ministry officials do not know on the basis on which that list was developed. Right. Uh, uh, any questions from you, Gary, to Mr. Hogarth? Well, just to clarify, as I understand it, the uh, report of the good and bad school districts was prepared by the political staff of the minister. Well, I don't know that, Gary. I don't know where that report was or by whom. In That's other words, it. Mr. Hogarth doesn't believe that there's any report which can legitimately say that trail is worse than anything. Is that right? That's right. That's right. Larry? That same thing that our figures confirm. We went through the ministry statistics from last year, and trail is just about average, slightly below average in per pupil cost, and just about average in all of the areas of, of uh, pupil teacher ratio. Okay, my thanks to you, John Hogarth, the District 11 Trail Superintendent of Education, and now I'll get down to Casey's on the latest Van der Zam bulldozing with <laughs> Beijing and Keen after the break. Thanks, John. Thank you, Jack. Bye. After the break. I have a slight feeling of déjà vu. How's that for French? <laughs> <laughs> it means, for the benefit of BC High School graduates, that I've already been there, already seen. Is that right? Right. Is yes. that right? Yes. Yes. That's right. Van der Sam again. He laid down the law once more. Here last week, gentlemen, Gary Bajan and Larry Keane. There will be no layoffs if you reject arbitration increases and go into the new school year with no salary increases. Right, let me go first to Larry Keane. Okay, first of all, you have to look at what he means by no layoffs. The way he defines it, it doesn't mean anything. He said all the people who have contracts that uh, are temporary, that expire, he doesn't count that as a layoff if they aren't rehired. Re not replacing people who resign and leave isn't considered a layoff. That's three to 4,000 people who will leave the system this year. He doesn't have to, uh, you know, on that definition of layoffs, he can make that, that guarantee easily. The other part of it is he says that, that if there's no salary increase. Well, the reality is that a 3% arbitration award, which is what uh, five, uh, I believe, boards, four or five boards came in with, uh, covering about 20 districts, is a half a percent increase in salary for teachers this year. Because Bill 89 already takes 2.5% away from every teacher by closing the schools for five days and not paying the teachers for those days. Well, let me understand that and see if you agree. Bill 89 effectively takes away 2.5% of any, we'll say, average 3% increase because next year you're going to close the schools again for these periods. Bill 89 takes away five school days from teachers in 1983 in the salary that they normally would have received. Will be reduced by five school days? By five school days till the end of June. So right. therefore on a budgetary basis if they got a 3% increase that would reduce it by two and a half. That's right. But it was not enough days in some school districts case to be able to balance their budgets. Even going into 1983 school districts are going to get 45 million dollars less in 83 than they did in 82. And in figuring out their budgets, most school districts figured them out at zero. And for many districts, zero percent increase was still too rich. <coughs> they were going to have to <coughs> ask their teachers to give up not just the five days, but days beyond that. In Williams Lake's case, for instance, I think they're giving up 11 days in total. Five plus other days that they're supposed to at some point during the year. Not uh, anymore balance it through. Because no. the, the provincial government came through with 1.2 million dollars in federal money uh, in grants and so now the teachers in Williams Lake are going to get more than a 1 percent increase. Now, but let so me it wasn't, uh, <coughs> you know, although it, it, one of the possibilities it, had been that, it's, that was not going to The original deal. To keep yeah. it to my simple-minded thing. When Van der Zam says to me and I say to you, no increase, no layoffs. That's not true. That's, that's not true. 
if he wanted to make a meaningful commitment, he would say, if teachers take the same amount of income in 83, we will make sure that there's the same level of staffing that existed in 82, then that would be a meaningful offer. But what he's putting forward is basically saying, teachers take a pay cut and cut a whole lot of teachers out of the system too. <coughs> was because that the significance of the question that was asked him about uh, temporary contracts? That's right. That the, t the person who called in and said, what about, you know, uh, got to the def his definition of layoffs, which is a meaningless And he definition. said that the end of a temporary contract was not a layoff. That's right. Oh, I see. Because I was given some figures yesterday that if you cut 650 teachers now, you would meet his financial demands. But if you wait till later in the school year, it goes up three you'll have times. 1,500 retired and 1,000 layoff. It was up to 3,000. That's right. Yeah. Is but, that right? But that's a reduction in the number of staff in, in the schools. It might not be any individual teacher on a continuing contract who's going to be laid off. That's why the way in which he uses the word makes all of those things meaningless because he, he doesn't look at the reduction in the number of teachers in the system, which is what you have to look at if you're going to be concerned about the quality of service. Attrition, retirement, and temporary that's right. contracts. Yeah, and that's, that's three to 4,000 teachers each year between those three Just factors. Just once more on that with feeling. Can attrition and retirement not handle it? No, no, not in 1983 because uh, of the reduction in funds that are available to school districts and the continual cutback, we cannot afford to be able to go above the zero and maintain the current level of staffing beyond June. And because the minister will not give to school boards the management right to adjust its staff in January or at the midterm break uh, at Easter, the number grows by three times in June. What do you mean you don't? Surely you can chop people whenever you want. No, we can't. We have to be able to, uh, uh, we have given contracts out to our staff and the contracts are good till June. And the minister in Bill 89 said, nobody can be let go until the end of the school year. And therefore, as a major employer in this province, I cannot adjust my staffing until June now because the minister will not allow us that permission. Didn't realize that. Well, we're just another impasse. Is that correct? Well, the, certainly there's a, a, a serious problem there, and the serious problem is not teacher salaries, as the minister would like to have us believe. There are minuscule increases, you know, hardly anything at all in in the arbitration awards, and yet he's trying to make that the problem. When in fact the problem is that the government is adding a third level of cuts to funding and education yeah. on Mind top you, of the two in Even with the net half percent, many teachers will get the 3% incremental increases. No, the 3% is not the, the incremental increase. The total payroll cost of increments is about a half a percent. Yeah. Another example of the misinformation that the minister gives out. Yeah, I see the point. The cost of a 3% annual incremental for the first 10 or 11 years is half a percent of the total On total payroll. payroll. Because uh, uh, the majority of teachers, in fact, are already at maximum and I don't get any I think it's about 50% uh, will we'll get an increment. Uh, when, when do you have to complete your budgets for next year? We have to have them in uh, before the end of January. And he, his department has to approve it? They have to go into his... They've already told us how much money we can spend. Now we have to take that amount and plan it out for the whole of the calendar year 83. What do you foresee that for... What do you foresee for cuts after June? I f uh, forecast that there would be roughly 3,000 positions uh, reduced from the service uh, at the end of June. And that is because we have not got the management rights to adjust it now. If we were able to adjust it now, it probably would have been in the 500 to 1,000 range in January. Uh, but we can't do that. But if they were doing it now, what would be happening is that classes would be disrupted everywhere where they were firing teachers right now. They'd be pulling teachers out. They'd have to be uh, moving, splitting up those classes, adding them to other classes, The point you say is that even if Gary Bejan wanted to cut the number of teachers now, it would wreck the system. That's right. I don't agree with that. I agree that it will uh, disrupt some places in the system, but I would far rather disrupt at 650 positions than have to see 3,000 programs, teachers, positions gone in June. Because but, to but, me, when we have to let that many go, that's going to affect us by 10 percent throughout course, the that's, province. But that's not the alternative. The government only has to put, a, you know, has to, to only meet their own, res, own restraint guidelines or less than that of a 6% increase. And there would be all the money you need to maintain the system and in fact improve the system. 
if they would simply put, you know, to give the boards the same amount of money that they, uh, in 83, that they had in 82. That would relieve much of the pressure that, that Mr. Bajan legitimately feels. I would agree. We have called for as trustees that the government live up to its 6 and 5 percent program. But the present time, the government has said to us, they're not going to give education 6 and 5. They're going to take away more. And all I can do as a manager of the system is accept that they've got that what they've said to me and try and put political pressure on them to live up to six and five, but in the meantime, I have to run a system. Yeah. But what happens well, now? Well, today's newspaper, I think on the front page, the, the article in the province indicates a possi <coughs> possibility for change that says that government revenues are likely to be up eight to 11 percent next year. I think that's garbage There's, myself. Well, the, certainly the, in the forestry industry, people are being called back to work. Uh, two times being called back to work, but you know, what that indicates, if you want to get political for a moment, is a little bit of propaganda coming out of Victoria to make us all spring and leap and jump for joy for a spring election. That's what that's aiming at. Nothing to do with revenues. Well, it may well be that political nonsense. If, 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 there's a, the if there's a spring election, it may well be the government will choose to put some more money in and relieve the problem in education. Well, Van der Zandt did say the other day, well, I might be able to get a little extra money, remember? But he's only talking about for 12 to 14 school districts, and he's claiming he's going to give that money to the school districts that were so-called good, yeah. you know, and we don't know uh, what criteria good Okay, uh, Gary Bajan, chairman of the board of... BC School Trustees and Larry Keane of BCTF after the break. <laughs> Let's go to another Van der Zandt point. He's lying on the beach in Waikiki somewhere. I've asked him half a dozen times for a list of the Total list of all school administrators' salaries in BC, and I can't get it. I want to see if it's true what they say about Surrey. Overloaded from top to bottom with chief executive officers, deputy superintendents, assistant deputy superintendents, personnel departments, maintenance foremen, deputies, superintendents by the thousand. Have you done any examination? Can you give me the figures for administrative salary throughout the province? That information is available, Jack, in Victoria. Each school board has to file it once a year in the Public Disclosures Act, and we have to uh, submit it to the ministry itself and also to government in the Auditor General's Department. And so the information is readily available to anyone. Uh, you merely just have to either ask your local school district for it, or you can contact the ministry in Victoria. And from, Bar from your school district in Barnaby, you'd give me a breakdown of the salaries of everybody that everybody received and their job. Exactly. No problem. No problem at all. How many superintendents, how many administrators have you got in the Burnaby school system? We have one superintendent and three assistants. Mm -hmm. We have uh, four supervisors and uh, then we have classroom or school-based uh, principals. We have uh, only vice principals at the secondary and junior secondary level. Yeah, VP1s and VP2s? No, just one vice principal per school. How much does your superintendent, your boss get? Uh, he gets about $85,000 a year. And your three superintendents? Uh, they would run at about seventy-five. And your four supervisors? Uh, they would get a uh, scale plus a percentage, so they would probably be in the forty-five to $50,000 range. Well, they're not poorly paid, you must confess. Not poorly paid. Do you have too many? Why do you need th three? Deputies in Burnaby. We have 18 and a half thousand students. We have roughly uh, 1,400 staff between teachers and non-teaching staff, and their responsibility is to work with those people. How do you figure in the report card? Uh, we came out uh, just slightly above average on some things, and other things we got uh, slightly below. Did you hear Van der Zandt say, Larry, that uh, he's going to bring in changes in legislation for regional bargaining this year? Does that please you or make you unhappy? Well. It I don't, don't know what to believe because over the past four months we've heard from him that he's going to fire teachers if they go on strike. We've heard him say he's going to give them the right to strike. He's said that he's going to have uh, province-wide bargaining, regional bargaining. That he's going to take away all of our right to bargain working and learning conditions and to give us full collective bargaining. 
So it's, it's an absolute mishmash. He gets headlines every time he makes one of those statements, completely contradicting the previous one. Hey, Who knows what we're going to get? He told me he thinks free collective bargaining will be better than arbitration, and that he would give you the right to strike. And that's a complete contradiction. Complete contradiction to what he said three months ago. Give me a summary report card in Van der Zam in short form, please, uh, and the grades you would give him for any specific um, well, I, I quality like, of a minister. Mr. Vanderzem likes report cards so much I went through and, and developed seven items that uh, are key about the minister, key elements of the role of Minister of Education and he fails in all of them. In consultation, in consistency, the example I just gave you is use of facts. We just saw one in terms of trail. Uh, building public confidence in the school system. Respect for democracy and local autonomy fails. Respect for the independence of quasi-judicial boards, such as arbitration boards, fails. Planning fails in every one of those. And he talks too much and distracts teachers in this province from being able to do the job that they, in fact, are hired to do. Should he be removed as Minister of Education by ben as Minister of Education by Premier Bennett? Well, I'm not sure why Mr. Bennett even appointed him Minister of Education in the first place. He had to know what the results of that were going to be. The style that he brings to all of his ministries uh, s surely led him to believe that, that this is exactly what would happen. But he is so charming, is he not? On a personal basis, there's no doubt about it, he can be very charming. But he sits there and sounds very convincing in saying things that simply oh, no. aren't true. Next question. He is definitely bringing in province-wide exams this year, grades 4, 8, and 12. Do you accept that with grace? I accept the fact that the exams are coming in. Uh, we certainly, as trustees, have supported the concept of examinations, providing they're not going to be used as a vehicle to compare student to student in a very negative way. Uh, certainly exams uh, are there to assist the classroom teacher and seeing how the child has developed, but we don't want to see them used in the poor and the good uh, kind of comparisons, okay? At the present time, he issued a series of reports on exams uh, that uh, were being used to help improve the curriculum. And he's using it as a vehicle to judge whether or not students have performed poorly or, or uh, badly and well and good and all those kinds of expressions. I'd like to get the Larry Keene's reaction. Do you welcome province-wide exams, 4, 8, and 12, which he's bringing in this year? presumably set by the province. Not if they're uh, simply a political tool to, uh, to attack again. Uh, we, we support uh, the use of examinations for diagnostic purposes to find out how well students are doing in a particular class so that the teacher can in fact improve the instruction in that class. But all of the signs that we've seen is that that's not the purpose that he designed, he's plans to use these tests You'll for. You'll have to tell me again what's wrong with a province-wide exam which shows a parent and a pupil, how they did in relation to other people in the province. Well, it depends entirely on what you're examining. I, I mean, want to know if my like boy's a, bright or stupid. But, but an exam doesn't necessarily, necessarily tell you that. You know, you only have to look at the examples that, that Gary's given of the, uh, the assessment program. That's not what it's designed to do. Uh, you, you ask certain questions that may be relevant in one area, not in another. For example, in the first of the assessment program exams, they had questions on there that, that included things about stoplights. A child had to have experience in a particular cultural you know, area, in, in the urban areas of, of BC. Children in the rural areas of BC don't do as well on that kind of a test when, it, when it's culturally biased like that. Mm -hmm. There are all sorts of problems you get into in looking for a simple answer to what's a complex did, problem. Did you, what did you think of Van der Zam's remark that he would like to see the system going back to where people fail in grades, that they be kept in that grade for another year? Is that a retrograde step or a step forward? I would oppose it because I think that children should be able to move along with their peer group, with their age group, and that the school system, if it is on its toes, is assisting those children so that we don't have that failure. Because in the end, those kids that are going to be identified as the failures will go back and being turfed out onto the streets. And if we want the system to do that, then we'll go back to what happened in the 50s. Those that don't produce, kick them out onto the streets and they become a statistic out there. Let some other ministry take care of them. Larry Keen. At the secondary school level, if a student, already, if a student fails a course that's one of the requirements for graduation, they have to take that course again until they pass it or they, they don't uh, achieve graduation. At the elementary level, I agree entirely with Gary that, that we 
you know, we have to keep the, the children with their, their age groups. There are so many advantages to the child from that that uh, to adopt the, the, the old-fashioned methods that Mr. Van Der Zem is looking at would be destructive. More with Messrs. Bejan and Keen after the break. Before I go to the phones, a couple of things I've got to clean up. Briefly, clue me in on what Van der Sam said the other day about English being the only compulsory subject for graduation. Well, that's, that's not the case at all. There, there, in grade 11 and 12, there are four compulsory subjects, uh, and you must also be registered in a program or a, uh, on a program that requires certain other subjects. Now, it depends on the program which others are required. But he was wrong other. again. He was wrong again. Van, give him a, a failure in knowledge of the system. A, a great, yeah, a very poor failure. Um, Surrey snubbed the minister. His hometown school board snubbed him. Will you let Van der Zam teach in Burnaby if he asks you nicely? If Mr. Van der Zam would like to come to Burnaby to be a resource person to our classroom teachers in a particular subject area for however long he wants, he's more than welcome to come, providing he doesn't bring the television cameras and the radios into the classroom uh, for the day as a publicity stunt. As a resource person, as a minister of the crown, he's more than welcome to come into our classrooms. That's right. The teachers wouldn't grieve it, would they? Not if, as, as long as it's on reasonable conditions. If yeah. it's just a, a publicity stunt, then we obviously the don't them. want that. The arbitration, you wanted to make a point in arbitration, and I wanted to ask you about this Kootenai arbitration where they gave 2% for a severance pay pool, and he says it's illegal. Okay, Jack, over the years we've had in British Columbia uh, binding arbitration, and that has been put in place in order to keep labor unrest out of the public schools so that schools were not shut down, that children knew that they had a complete year of education, and that teachers and boards knew what salary yes, yes. settlements would be, okay? Uh, the minister has said that uh, he's going to change that because he thinks teachers have received a better settlement over the years. If he were to look at the statistics from his own government's labor ministry, he will find that settlements in this province for teachers uh, and ultimately school boards are within a half a percentage point on the average of what's happening in unionized settlements throughout BC. But you mustn't ignore the fact, despite what they're talking about, an increase in revenue, that they're pretty strapped for cash. They may well they be strapped no money. for cash, but is he prepared to see the system shut down with strikes? in order to try and save money. Is he prepared to see kids on the street in order well, to save when he, money? When he said he'd give the right to strike, I said, don't be stupid, you're not going to lock out the schools, right? He ain't going to lock out the schools. And are you a union or an association? We, we aren't a union that's covered under the Labor Code. We're the only group that's excluded under that. But mm -hmm. uh, we're listed as a union in the Ministry of Labor uh, Statistics. OK, anything I've missed that you want to say? Well, what's going to happen now? You, you, of course, are merely watching from the outside, really, as a spokesman for all of the teachers, not being directly involved in any bargaining as such. That's right. The bargaining is all done locally. Uh, in terms of what's going to happen, there are so many uncertainties in, in the, the whole process. We don't know how much money is going to be there. He says there will be some more money, or there may be some more money. We don't know what, uh, okay. what's going to go on. I'm going to go to the phones. Go ahead. Are you still there in Shawnigan Lake? Yeah, I am. Go Good ahead. Morning, Good morning. Yeah, it's uh, really funny, like, in Shawnigan Lake here, just before the the kids went back to school, or came out, came out of school for the Christmas break, they were, they were out of school more than they were in school. And another thing, they've got two schools here, and they split up the elementary into two different schools, and they're maintaining two buildings. And it's, that must be quite the cost right there. You're saying that Shawnigan School Board doesn't know, school district doesn't know what it's doing, is that right? Not really. It's just that uh, Your point I can't is, see why they, why they should have to maintain two buildings. Well, we can't really get into that in detail unless you happen to know Shawnigan. I don't know the Shawnigan Lake situation. Okay, go ahead, please. Hello. Hello, yes. Uh, Mr. Webster? Yes, ma'am. I'm not a teacher, but recently the MPs back east that said in the paper voted themselves a 51 or 52 percent increase. Now, teaching is not a particularly high-paying job. I consider the education of children vital. I want to know if there's any humane way to remove an uneducated slob like Vanderzelm, who we allow to run screaming and frothing at the mouth over our children's education. Well, ma'am, I uh, thank you on behalf of Mr. Vanderzelm for these compliments. Um, <laughs> there's only one way to remove Mr. Vanderzelm, 
Uh, that's to defeat the government, I suggest. Would you not agree? Well, that's uh, what's yes. available to the public. Well, oh, I do hope you we can get rid of him. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Happy New Year, Willie and Waikiki. <laughs> You've just been called a blank blank. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Morning. Uh, I'm very happy that we have Vander Zam as a Minister of Education. At least the public gets more information at the present time than we ever did before. And I'm in favor of the report cards for the children so that we know exactly where they stand. Thank you, sir. We've You're always both. had report cards. And, and unfortunately, it, much of the information is misinformation that we get from the minister. Yeah, but you don't have competitive report cards, do you? No, we no. have report cards. I know, I know I'm not allowed to say that. But <laughs> when you say report cards, even when my kids were at school, the report cards were pretty meaningless. Well, they're ones designed for the child, so that the I parent understand. understands where the child's at. There is a form of report card prepared. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Hello. That's you. Is it, um, is it, is this the right to the a student that's going to school? Are you doing very good in school? Is, there, is it the teacher's right to tell the student, why don't you quit school and go to work? And he's doing very good. We can't make a judgment on that, but I can imagine circumstances where that might arise, not talking about this kid. Yeah. You? Uh, in turn, well, I can't imagine telling a student that, that they should quit school unless the, there were a serious problem in terms of uh, behavior or whatever. Now, but, if that uh, parent uh, wants to get to the bottom of what he regards as injustice to his child, will he get satisfaction? Yes, he will. What line was that on, by the way? Is that the same man? No, it's not. I, you know, they get pushed around sometimes. But if it's in Burnaby, you'll make sure he gets satisfaction. Darn students, yes. Right? Go ahead, please. Hello. Is this me? That's you, sir. Yes, well, I, I'd like to speak to you, Jack. I think you're letting these guys off just a little late here today. Uh, you know, the, the whole name of the game in education is to uh, enlighten the young people. It seems that their main objective is to uh, feather bed and, and to uh, 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 pave the way for teachers. Uh, I live out in school dif district 43. Uh, I think the, the education that uh, has been provided my children now that through the system has just been absolutely horrendous. Uh, every year I've gone up to the schools and asked uh, various teachers uh, what the performance objectives were uh, in different uh, subject areas uh, that my children were, were going to be studying, and uh, it was all a hazy mishmash of uh, okay, you're talking about school reviews and this, That's that, and the other here. thing. and. Uh, uh, because of this, when they went on to uh, the next grade, there was uh, a, a lot of mismatch and, and uh, well, just not, let me connecting up uh, things like this. I think this whole deal is a scam that these people are, are uh, particularly this, this Larry Keene. Uh, I think, they, uh, you know, if, if they really wanted to uh, look out for the child's welfare, they would be all in favor of having standardized examinations. Uh, every year so that uh, not only could the students be monitored but uh, perhaps some of the teachers you know the ones that are in there just dogging it and uh, waiting for the bell to go at, at uh, the end of the school day okay uh, hold it hold it hold it you've made a very good and a common point which is why so many van der Zam has so many supporters but do you want to tackle that there are many people who are extremely unhappy about the product of the system well the the push for totally standardizing the, the curriculum and the like simply is inappropriate when you have children who are so different, uh, that their needs are so different. You have to, in fact, build programs that meet the different needs of those children. Right, you, can, you can't simply have a, a straight across the board type of thing that, that I gather that this caller wants. I, I venture to say that many parents in British Columbia are fully in favor of a return to full discipline, standard examinations, and placed report, report cards which show places. I hate to tell you, but it's probably the truth. I think parents uh, throughout British Columbia would support a return to a standardized test uh, that would give them an indication as to how their child is improving. But I don't think they want to see a list posted that would show where the ranking was of their child with other kids so that it would be produced and, and publicized around. Yeah, even I wouldn't, I, would, even I wouldn't go along with that. Thank you, sir. We'll more with Beijing and Webb and Keen after break. Wow. 
Just to get the financial position clear after van der Zand's latest statements and objectives, do you now know whether you're coming or going in school financing? We know how many dollars we're going to have for 1983 and that is subject to the budget being brought down by the provincial government in April and the promise of maybe more money by the minister. But at the moment, yes, every school board knows how many dollars they can spend in 1983. Has landing enrichment of the special tuition of people who are mainstreamed, mainlined into the school, has that been cut in many places yet? It hasn't been cut by school districts because uh, the minister has said the funds that he puts in from the province, uh, those programs cannot be cut. But for instance, in my district, we put in $600,000 of our own money into the special needs programs, and that money could be cut if a school district wanted to. Will you now, cut yours? We in Burnaby will not cut that, but some school districts have already had to cut that part of their budget. Thereby reducing the special attention for kids with special needs. That's right. But it, in terms of mainstreaming, what you're talking about is taking a, a, a child with a handicap, or a, a disabled child, putting him in a regular classroom. For example, if you have a blind child in a classroom and you just add more students to that classroom, forget about the special ed kinds of things, they're in a regular class, you add more students, that child is simply going to get less attention and so are all the rest is of the children in that yet? class. Is that happening yet? It has happened this year, class sizes are larger this year, there are a thousand fewer teachers in the system in September than were budgeted for last February. Go ahead, please. Oh, good morning. Morning. I, uh, I would just like to let you know where I'm coming from. I had an experience with Mr. Vanderzamp several years ago at the, the Variety Club telethon. Oh, now, what, what do I want to know about this for? Some personal rancor? Well, it? no, no, no. I just want, and uh, then you, you'll understand. Uh, dealing with uh, Mr. Vanderzamp is like dealing with a child that uh, has had his own way all his entire life. He's never... Uh, uh, I don't, everything he's ever wanted no, I don't, I don't mind an offhand remark about Willie van der Zyme. He's a big boy, but let's not go back into variety telethons. I don't know what he's going to say, and I'm not about to chance it. Nanaimo, go ahead, please. Yes. I heard the other day that Mr. Van der, following Mr. Van der Zyme's proposal to uh, teach in the schools, that he'd be welcomed by the BC Teachers Federation, but would be opposed by, I believe it was the school trustees. Of Surrey on the ground that he didn't have a valid teacher's license. Well, we've overcome that this morning. He's been given an invitation on um, reasonable terms to be a resource person in a Burnaby school for a couple of days. Oh, yeah, because I taught in the schools, and uh, I substituted for uh, a number of years, and we had uh, several teachers uh, substituting her. Or... With no certification. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yes, ma'am. Well, my, uh, my summation of teachers nowadays are not teachers. They are just fooling the public, and with the salaries they're getting, I just can't believe it. When I went to school and report cards were handed out then, we damn well learnt, or there was problems. And a parent, a parent, my parent, if I didn't come up to his mark, then I got it at home as well. Okay, ma'am, thank you. That's a commonly held view of middle-aged people. Go ahead, isn't it? There, it's held by people who no longer have children in the system, okay? And in many cases that uh, these people no longer have the children in the system and they're not a part of what's currently happening and they are expressing something of a memory or an experience that they had as a student in school. Fair enough. Go ahead, please. Hello? That's you, sir. Uh, Jack, I want to say that as a parent, um, Van der Sam has destroyed my confidence in the ability of this province to run an education service. I'd like to ask Gary Bajan if he can give me some good reasons why I should not remove my 13-year-old son uh, from the state system in British Columbia and put him into a private school, which I think will be managed far better than BC seems to be able to manage its schools with Van der Sam at the helm. Well, I believe Mr. Van der Zam has made many public statements that certainly uh, could discourage a person from being a part of the public system. But out there in our schools, and I know in my community, we're still teaching children how to read and to write and to give them an experience uh, in other subject areas. And so I believe in the public school system, and I know it's touching my children, and I hope that it's helping your child too. I do not want to put my children in private school. I think the public system is providing that service. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Hello. Yep. Yes, uh, I am a product. I'm not a middle-aged product either of the private school system. And uh, definitely, I do not understand in any way or form why there is not, say, an O-level or an A-level system, why there isn't just basic subjects taught in school instead of mechanics and 
ridiculous subjects which you're able to take now, which probably waste a hell of a lot of money. Why not just teach some basic things? Good point, because Van der Zandt said the other day, they probably come out of school, they can't read or write, what's that effect, but they can ski and swim at public expense. No, but, but he takes it one, one course, the, this community recreation, and he tries to characterize the whole system with that. That's one course that maybe 2,000 st students take as one-seventh of their program at the secondary school. That isn't what the public schools are about. That isn't most of what's going on in the public schools at all. And it's totally unfair to characterize the schools What's with wrong that. with the British system of all levels and day levels? Is that too competitive for us? I think that even the British are, are, have, have moved away from that kind of a system. It's, it's a, a streaming kind of system that doesn't fit with the democratic ideals. Well, that I've got have grandchildren been held going, to school, going to school, forbid the mention of the word, in England. Uh, who are going through this O-level and A-level nightmare, and it certainly makes them work like Billy be damned. You got that right. Well, Mr. Van der Zandt... I mean, it, it produces the competitive spirit, and the competitive spirit seems to be evil in this country today. Oh, well, I think you can have a competitive spirit in the public school system, but what I don't want to see is I don't want to see the public schools become a so-called average. I don't want to see us just providing the dot-dot basics, and if you've got money, then you go someplace else. Gentlemen, I'm grateful. Larry Keane, BCTF, Gary Bajan, BC School Trustees. We haven't solved anything this morning, but it may well be that the educational system in British Columbia is the edge of a, not a collapse, but a major crisis and possibly a change of direction if social credit stays in power. Agreed? If uh, certainly th this minister would like to do that. Thank you. After the break. I'm well aware you never settle anything with these educational interviews, but they are important. And as I said, maybe a big crisis really coming up in the next year or two. Tomorrow morning, one of the stories we're going to cover is an interview with Art Gibbon of the workers, workers, not allowed to say workmen, workers compensation board. And there'll be a union. Kathy Walker will be here too. And other stuff. And a memo to Robinson tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs>